everybody. Hello and welcome to uh, the new Poetry Society um, with me and my special guest for this week. So we're on episode eight, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, this is brought to you by um, Inspire for the Nottinghamshire Libraries and the Nottingham County Council, and also from the Nottingham Poetry Festival and uh, Metronome and uh, Confetti, who uh, do all the biz. Uh, NTU, uh, who are behind uh, some of those corporates, uh, and um, the Arts Council. So lots of people involved. So thank you to every one of those. Uh, and thank you to you for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the series so far. So my special guest uh, today, uh, we shall be chatting, we shall be um, reading some poems, and uh, we shall be answering some of your questions. So we have a chat facility, which down the side of the uh, uh, screen, at least it is on mine, and also a Q&A facility. Now, about halfway through, so we're gonna do an hour, so that's about our, our half an hour. Um, I'll be asking you to uh, give me your questions for uh, Leanne and um, hopefully uh, she will answer some of them. So uh, I've let the cat out of the bag. There you go. You probably know anyway. So uh, um, my guest today is one of the busiest uh, poets that I know and one of the most inventive. Uh, she's a poet, performer and educator. Please welcome Leanne Moden. Hi, Leanne. Hello. Hi. Hey, Opa. Are you all right? Yes, thank you. How are you? All right, I think now. Uh, um, I, I bet you've done quite a few of these Zooms, have you? I've done, an, I've, I've done a few, yeah. Yeah, they never get any easier, though. Is that right? I was going to say, uh, are you, have you, because before the, the lockdown, um, I'd not done any of these. I, I'd done one Skype call, um, which was to Steve Coogan. And uh, um, for the whole of the uh, Skype call, uh, he was looking at the little box of himself in the corner. <laughs> So all I saw was the top of his head for an hour. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, have, you, have you become you've become accustomed to them? The, the Zoom? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, I've done a few performances on Zoom since uh, March of last year, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a funny old game, isn't it? Because everybody's on mute, so you're not getting any laughs in the right places, <laughs> and you're not getting no. any. <laughs> Very, very, very difficult for a narcissist such as myself. <laughs> but uh, I'm getting used to it, definitely. And it is nice to have the connection, isn't it? And it's nice to be able to, you know, um, speak to people. And I've, I've done some poems at a, an event in Holland and oh, one right. in New York, all yeah. on the Zoom. So uh, stick that on the CV, you know. Nobody oh, needs it, to know. It's nice to be we've, got, we've got somebody from Belgium looking. I think it's Eva from Belgium looking in uh, uh, today. So you're international today. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you'd be based in Beeston, aren't you? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, which is a little bit into, a little bit exotic, shall we say? It, it is absolutely. Although I'm on the Lenton Abbey side, so I still technically count as the city, but I like to say Beeston because it's now, much more fancy. I, I, <laughs> I remember, uh, um, and uh, and this is probably going to happen again. I remember Beeston used to be one of the premier poetry venues in the country. Um, when I when I first started, uh, so uh, I'm going back uh, to the sort of the eighties. Um, uh, the the poets that they used to have at Beeston Library were, you know, all the great uh, poets in the in the country, and me. Uh, um, so I was very, I was very pleased. My dad actually came to Beeston to see me, so I, I thought it was very prestigious. Um, uh, but it's it's becoming uh, quite a, a big place at the moment in Beeston. Yeah, I mean we've got our poetry collective, Paper Cranes, that um, meet or used to meet at Beeston Library. Now we're sort of on Zoom, like everything is. But uh, yeah, there's there's lots of really talented poets who live in the in the sort of enclaves of Beeston. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's a very creative part of um, the the city and the county, definitely. Yeah, and uh, um, can people join your uh, group if they uh, if they live around Beeston? No, probably not Belgium, Absolutely. but. Uh... Well, you know, you never know. I mean, since we've gone online, we've had a few members join from London and Manchester, and obviously they won't be able to join us when we go back to the library, hopefully when we do. But yeah, we're always looking for new members for the collective. What we do is we meet every two weeks uh, on Zoom at the moment, and we um, share work 
talk and sort of do writing exercises together and 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 sort of help each other and uh, inspire each other and it's been a real lifeline actually through lockdown to have something to look forward to sounds sad when I say it like that but it is it's it's been such a beautiful um thing to be part of and to no to I don't I don't there. think that's sad at all Leanna yeah. I think we we need we need uh, activity and distraction and uh, and uh, something to pull us passion into and and I know you're very passionate about poetry. So we met originally uh, at a library. Yes. Uh, um, and we were doing a, a library gig and, um, uh, and you, you, we were both reading some poems. Now, have you got a poem to kick us off today? Absolutely. So I'm going to start with a sonnet. We're going to keep it nice and highbrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is um, a poem that's about um, Gertrude Erdele, who was the first woman to swim the channel in 1926, um, and this is a sonnet about her, and it's called Queen of the Waves. Tempestuous, the channel wants you dead and flings her filthy flotsam in your face. Just focus on your stroke, your breath, your pace. Your strongest muscle now is in your head. Exhausted, still you carry on the crawl. It's fight or flight, and you embrace them both. You wonder where you ever found the gall, but perseverance brings you to the coast. And later, when they claim the sea was kind, you'll taste the sting of salt as sharp as blood and call the spiteful surfing surge to mind and wonder if it did you any good. But like the ocean, you will not be bid. They said, I couldn't do it, so I did. <laughs> oh, I like that! What a what a great ending as well. That's classic. Uh, uh, that that's um, you, you can you can imagine uh, that as um, uh, one of these inspirational quotes, can't you? That last line. Yeah. Well, um, it's actually what she said when yeah. um, when confronted with it. So I thought it needed to be in the poem. So. Oh yeah, 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 and or a t-shirt. That that would be great. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. No. Uh, there's nothing nothing that spurs you on more than somebody saying that you can't do something. Exactly. Oh, I, I, I love to prove people wrong. I, I, there's many people said that I wouldn't, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, do anything with my life in terms of uh, uh, poetry or writing, um, including um, my ex-boss when I left work. At the, he mm. said, "Don't." He said, "Don't make your hobby your um, your life's work." Um, which is precisely what I've I've done, and I'm I'm sure uh, to a certain degree it's what you've done, uh, yeah. um, and uh, how wrong he was. I mean, uh, um, I would certainly never make an insurance broke in my hobby, uh, and uh, to think <laughs> that 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 would be my life work. I you know, I'm I'm sure I'm sure uh, there's lots of insurance brokers out there that do a great job. Uh, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, so uh, sonnet. Yeah. Solid. So, uh, um, uh, I, I, some people are not so keen on form. T tell me your views on form. I absolutely love form. It's my favourite thing. Um, when I'm stuck for something to write, um, when I've got a bit of the old writer's block, I um, to go to my Rolodex of different forms and go, oh, shall I, shall I brush up on a villa now? Shall I have a little go at a festina? I really think that the way that I like to write is almost like having form as like a structure to work within, like a bit of a scaffolding. And I think personally, I find it really helpful to sort of um, organise my thoughts into something that, that feels like it's less, or that it's better than a blank page for me. I know that a lot of people find form quite scary or find that it sort of doesn't work for them and they feel constricted by it. But I really thrive on constraints and saying, oh, you can write this poem, but you can't use the letter E, and then see what <laughs> happens. I love all that. I really do. That's good. Because I mentioned in the introduction, you're very inventive, and, and you know, from what I've seen of your work, and I've got your, your book, um, there is a lot of invention. It, you know, that's, that's something you're... So you like obstacles to overcome. I do, yeah. That's that's an interesting way of putting it, and I'll probably put that to my therapist when I'm in there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that is true. I do like to sort of put a little roadblock in my way and go, okay, get out of that mode and see yeah, what yeah. And, and see what happens. And I find that that's when I'm my most creative. 
Oh, great. Now, I've, I've got a sonnet. I've only written one. Ooh. But funnily enough, okay. I, I, I didn't know you were going to do a sonnet, but I've selected it for today. Uh, and um, I, what, what it was, I, I was um, I was asked to read at the birthday celebration for um, uh, Shakespeare uh, at uh, Stratford um, when it was his big one. Um, mm. uh, I can't remember how many... Uh, how many years now but uh, it was a big one with lots of noughts yeah. and um and uh so i was thinking about what i have in common with him uh, and uh, i read up a, a, a bit about shakespeare and um what i found was that for the last few years of his life he gave up london and he moved back to stratford and i thought that, that must have been quite a jolt for him because there he was in the middle of it all with all the fame and everything uh, and all the, you know, the activity and the people. Now, now obviously, I, I retired uh, recently and I don't go to London and I'm not involved with television. So I thought I'll, I'll use that as, as, as my in. So this is called In Thy Horizons Be All Thy Sin... Be all, sorry. In Thy Horizons Be All My Sins Remembered. Now, I don't know whether you know where that's from. That's from Amlet, Act... Three, scene one, and um, it's the soliloquy that starts to be or not to be. Cool. And I love the fact that people always remember to be or not to be, but they don't remember the end lines. Uh, and there's something in, uh, really about whether or not we remember the beginnings of things and when we remember the ends of things. And uh, as I say, um, people don't really say much about the end of uh, Shakespeare's life. So uh, this was a, um, a, a sonnet to uh, Shakespeare, there we go. To walk away is a dramatic act, to choose to be but ghost in your own grief, a name soon forgotten after the fact, anonymous to universal thief. You cannot wear thin now your triumphs past, the tallest tree in winter is but limbs, be husband dear and father, these things last, your fame was ever one of fate's cruel whims. Now you are defined in the present tense, for here you're only who you choose to show. In these now lesser words, your soul finds sense. In these deeds today are where your virtues glow. No more old tales told of your beauteous youth, the dark lady waiting, now death and truth. Oh, beautiful, love that. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was... Um, it's very difficult to to write something uh, to Shakespeare, isn't it? Because obviously he is, you know, mega. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, uh, um, but I, I was I was pleased. I'd, I'd give it a go. And uh, as you say, the form makes you really concentrate your mind, doesn't it? And rather than just sort of write something and go, well, that's good enough, you really have to make it work and make the uh, you know the uh, the rhythm of it work. Yeah, that's right, definitely. So, in your uh, workshops, and I know you've uh, you you give workshops as well, don't you, to uh, to people? Um, uh, you, you know what um, what drove you to do that? What, uh, what well, um, yeah, that's a really good question, actually. I think when you are doing writing as a profession, and um, you're sort of I'm, I'm, yeah, I flatter myself that I'm a fairly gregarious person. A lot of writing is just like sitting alone and 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 doing your writing. And um, I needed more than that. Um, and I thought that uh, writing workshops were a nice way to, for me to pass on the knowledge that I had and also to, to listen to other people's writing. Because I don't know about you, but a lot of my inspiration for where I write comes from conversations, comes from listening to other people's poems, comes from reading other people's work. Um, and workshops are just a really nice way to sort of bounce ideas off one another and, and, and sort of... Um, be part of like a bit more of a poetic community rather than just being in your garret um, doing your sonnets on your own with with all your hair tumbling down the uh, the stonework. I uh, I don't think I could live like that to be honest. With you. Do you know I, you've you've hit the nail on the head there with the word community and uh, that's something I've uh, strived for over the years and one of the reasons why I'm doing uh, this today and uh, one of the reasons why we we've got the. Um, the Nottingham Poetry uh, Festival and of course one of the reasons why we've got the City of Literature and I know you're involved in the City of Literature you're, you're uh, very much uh, uh, one of the workers. Yes yeah that's right so Nottingham has been a UNESCO World City of Literature since 
2015, we got the designation. And what that basically means is that um, we get to call ourselves a city of literature um, and we get to do all these like beautiful projects. Um, at the moment, uh, the one that we've just announced today, because it's National Writing Day, so happy National Writing Day. Um, <laughs> but yes, we've just announced our Summer of Freedom Reads, which is a really cool um, series of workshops uh, for young people aged 14 to 21, um, looking at writing and uh, the ideas around protest. Um, social justice and uh, banned books as well, because obviously we've got um, one of one of the most uh, talked about banned books is uh, yes. is local, you know. So the uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover um, trial, I think it was 1960, or oh, I'm bad with dates. That might not be right, um, but yes. Uh, so we're so we're really like doing this series of workshops with young people um, to uh, investigate that, investigate what it means, what sense means in writing and um, how we can uh, protect free speech while also making sure that we protect you know vulnerable groups of people in society it's a really meaty um, series of themes so it's oh, really right. so now when you say young people uh, what constitutes a young person well for this particular one it's 14 to 21 year olds right. so uh, yeah um, I'm really miffed because I just missed out yeah, on that yeah, age <laughs> Uh, if I count as two, two or maybe three, if I count as three people, then, then I just just missed out. Uh, it's funny actually because I, I, my my next radio show is uh, about aging, so I've mm. been looking at um, uh, what constitutes youth and what constitutes uh, aging, and uh, I, I found some very interesting facts out today. Um, your uh, as a human being, your physical peak is twenty five. Oh. So uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I don't know what I was doing yeah. at twenty five, but it's. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, I don't think there's any any more strenuous than what I'm doing now, to be honest with you. And your mental, uh, um, your mental capacity, uh, you know, mm -hmm. how quick you can think and that um, uh, peaks between 18 and 35, depending on which. Uh, oh, OK. I'm, I am in that bracket just about. So that's good. <laughs> good. Well, you be gentle with me. Uh, um, <laughs> But, it, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because of course, people live now to, you know, to, to uh, you know, in the 90s um, and yeah. uh, uh, and uh, obviously, we we value things like wisdom. Uh, and mm. uh, we, if you think about uh, the average age of the politicians, the average age of uh, the prime minister, the average age of people that we give responsibility to, uh, mm. it tends to be uh, older than twenty five, doesn't it? Uh, uh, and so uh, there's obviously other other factors beyond uh, what the mechanics of our body does. Uh, mm. um, so so it, it, I find that I find that very interesting. Now. Interesting fact, you know, I was nearly banned from uh, Berry Libraries. Why? What did you do? Well, I had a book out, uh, um, this is back in the 80s, uh, and um, it was part of uh, the, um, they gave uh, copies of my book to the libraries, and it was part of a, a big thing of, because um, I lived in Manchester at the time, of local libraries. Mm. And um, the, I did a performance at the uh, libraries for, um, in Berry and the mayor and mayoress of Berry came and uh, I said a rude word, uh, um, uh, which I won't repeat today. And um, the uh, lady mayor walked out and the mayor wrote down every rude word I said from then onwards, which <laughs> wasn't many. Uh, and uh, the next day in the paper, it said uh, 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 Tory, uh, too blue for Tory mayor. Uh, and then it said uh, Councillor Biggs, which was the Tory councillor, uh, was going to ban me from uh, Berry. And now, because oh, I'm going up to Bury for my um, my next tour, I thought I'd find out what's happened to uh, uh, to Councillor Biggs. Uh, and um, apparently, uh, uh, not long back, she was done for drunk driving. Uh, now, initially, initially, this this made the irony of it that, that somebody that's uh, that's um, guarding uh, um, values that was done for drunk driving uh, made me laugh. And then I read uh, that uh, she'd, um, uh, she, her defence was that the uh, wine that she drank um, was from a supermarket and uh, she thought it was non-alcoholic. <laughs> then, then I got this mental picture of her driving home from the supermarket, <laughs> drinking this wine, which was a bit sad, isn't it? Uh, and then I'd heard that um, I read the, in the newspaper report that she cried. 
oh. uh, um, uh, because her husband had left her and, uh, and she was a downward trend. And I walk quickly went from glee, went to compassion. Um, and uh, and it's interesting, isn't it, how we get the, like a, a little view of people and then mm-hmm. we, you know, we get some more information and, and you know, our, our, our view changes. And so I, I love the fact that, like myself, uh, Councillor Biggs is just a human with human frailty. Uh, um, yeah. And uh, it's one of the things I think uh, poetry teaches us, isn't it, that... Uh, we're all imperfect. Yeah, absolutely. I I have the same problem of always like whenever something happens, I'm always very quick to blame the other person and go, oh, that person did that because they're a bad person. And then you stop and think and reflect and go, oh, maybe they were having a bad day. Maybe you did something that was wrong for them as well. And it's just, it's about like remembering to recapture the nuance of yeah. being human, isn't it? Have you ever written a poem from the other person's point of view in an argument. No, but that's an excellent idea. Well, there's your task. That's, that's your obstacle <laughs> to overcome. Well, right, so next time now. I see you, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be wanting that poem. Now, uh, have okay. you got another poem for us today? Yes. So what I'd like to read for you now is, um, I'm currently working on a project with Newark Book Festival, um, writing about some of their historic buildings. So this is a poem for the governor's house. Uh, in Newark, which is a beautiful, um, old, sort of Tudor-style, stripy-beamed building. Um, It was originally used um, in the sieges of Newark in the uh, First Civil War, and um, it's now uh, Greg's the Baker's. Um, (laughs) So that felt like it needed a poem, so this is the poem for that. It's called Besieged. Let's celebrates our history. This place survived the civil war. When Newark was a town besieged, relieved in 1644, this building was a vital part of how the siege was lost and won, a timber bolstered hideaway where plans were forged and deals were done. It's stripy like a boiled sweet, but don't be fooled, it played its part. If Newark was a living beast, this town would be its beating heart. 300 years and more have passed since soldiers last surrounded town. But if they ever come again, I know where we can hunker down. So if the town's besieged again, let's make our way to Stodman Street. We'll hide out with the sausage rolls, all camouflaged by pastry treats. We'll shelter here among the loaves, the sandwiches and vegan bakes. Let folk outside do as they please. We'll be just fine beside the cake. <laughs> Great! Oh, I like that. So uh, now, uh, what's that a particular form? Obviously, I, I could, I, you know, I could see the rhythm and the um, uh, the rhyme to it. So it's a, so it's a bit of a sort of um, muddly ballad kind of form, yeah. yeah. So, but I like a bit of the um, the sort of dum 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 is yeah. like a nice form, especially when you're talking about Greg's. It feels like Greg's needs a <laughs> rhyming poem. You know? Do you know, I, I find sometimes form lifts up uh, uh, something um, uh, that gives it a dignity, it gives it a, um, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, you know, a depth that, uh, you know, so when you're talking about things like Greg's, um, so if, if I do a, a little sort of poem, you know, about poo or something like that, I always try to make it as, as tight a form as possible. Uh, even if it's a lim- limerick, uh, um, to uh, to at least justify that it's a poem and not just me talking about poo. Yeah. Um, so uh, I um, uh, I've been watching the football. You've been watching the football. No, I'm not a football person. I'm afraid. <laughs> now, see, I watch it like a soap opera. Uh, I, oh, I love okay. the soap opera of it. But uh, as I mentioned to you previously, um, uh, I'm, I'm aware that uh, that I'm, you know, sort of uh, that uh, a lot of the people that run around, that, that, that you never get footballers past the age of about 39 at most. Uh, mm. um, and I think uh, Bellingham, uh, one of the England players, was 17. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's interesting watching it and saying you should have done this and you should have done that as though, as though I'm capable of doing it. So I've written a little poem called Endgame. Demoting a passion to an obby, the parameters of my dreams, it seems, are simply not viable. I find I'm resigned to amateur status with wish fulfillment unreliable. Now in my 60s, 
I finally bow to reason. I can certainly rule out playing for England at the end of next season. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> we're, we're always putting off, aren't we? Um, uh, I think there's somebody famous once said that uh, old age is 15 years older than I am. Mm, that sounds about right, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I was my my mum uh, had a load a box full of old photographs that she was showing me this weekend, yeah. and it was um, photographs of her um, holding me as a baby, and she oh. was sort of. 27 and you know looking very grown up with a baby and I, I'm thinking oh god I'm 34 and I don't feel as grown up as she was in those photos so yeah being being oh, very aware that adulthood is sort of just over the horizon at some point yeah. and I'll get there eventually it's just such an interesting concept yes it's quite, quite interesting um, I always think about the word responsibility that if you're responsible for something somehow it makes you act more um, grown up, for want of a better mm. phrase. Uh, um, and if you have no responsibilities, then why should you be grown up? Well, exactly. I mean, the cat's sat over there, but other than that, I'm free as a bird. Well, that's <laughs> it. And, and, uh, you know, and funnily enough, uh, um, as you get to older, uh, older age uh, and your responsibilities become less, uh, um, and then uh, you can become a kid again. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you have got a brilliant book, which I, I, I've i uh, got a copy of, uh, and it's called um, Get Over Yourself. Get Over Yourself, yeah. What a great title. Now, why did you call it Get Over Yourself? Well, um, because, <laughs> because um, I had a bit of a crisis of consciousness when I was uh, writing it, of uh, thinking, oh, I don't know if I've got anything worth saying to say as a poet. You know, sometimes this happens and I'm sure it's happened to you in the past where you think oh you know what am I what am I what am I talking about what is this is this important what I'm saying here and so uh, a friend of mine when I was sort of chuntering away saying oh I don't know if I can write a book blah, 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 I said come on Leanne get over yourself and I thought do you know what that's that's the title and I think it speaks to the idea of you know being aware that you know we're not the most important voice in the universe but that's okay and it's still important to you know speak up and to speak out and to talk about the things that are important to you even if they're not important for anyone else um i think that's the the crux of it for me is that creativity for its own sake is really what the book is about um so yeah uh, I, it was just... I, I, I love that. I've got to say, and and, uh, and uh, you know, n neither of us uh, are in a war zone, uh, and, no. and neither of us, you know, uh, have had anything, um, uh, you know, uh, as dramatic as you see on the news most nights. Uh, um, although, you know, uh, obviously we've had us trials and tribulations, and within within a life. Um, you know, uh, even, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, quiet um, uh, sort of uh, challenges that we have uh, are important. And I think I think it's important that what you said there for, for lots of people thinking about why would they write. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, if, if people don't um, uh, sort of write poems about the the ordinary things in life, then they'll cease to be part of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the interesting things that happens to me when I go on community projects and I talk to people who don't consider themselves writers or who haven't done a lot of creative stuff, they'll always say to me, oh, I can't write a poem, I've got nothing to say. And then in the next breath, they will tell you the most interesting story about their lives something really fascinating and then you'll go what why aren't you putting that in a poem and then they'll go oh yeah and sometimes I think it's just people need to have an outside person say that is interesting I am interested in that um and some sometimes that's the nicest part of the job is to say what you, has happened to you your experiences are valid and important and I am interested yeah. um and that feels like such a beautiful thing to be able to empower people to go, actually, this is interesting and I am going to write about it, even if it's just for myself. You're absolutely right. Now, I, um, I, I found a way of opening people up is uh, asking them what's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to them. Oh, God. 
I hope you're not going to ask me that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you a moment to think about it. So, so uh, when I was running uh, a baby cow, um, one of my staff came in late one day. Uh, mm. And uh, as a joke, I said, uh, we've all uh, answered this question. Uh, what's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? Uh, as you've come late, could you, you know, add to the discussion? And uh, just as a laugh. Uh, and uh, uh, she said, uh, well, I was on a train and um, uh, and I was listening to one of those motivational tapes in my in my ear. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it was saying, you are with the universe. You are good enough. You are uh, at one. You are powerful. And, everything. and she says, and um, uh, when she got up to leave, she realised that she'd left a speaker on and everybody in the... No. <laughs> In the uh, in the train had, uh, had been listening to this. Oh no! That's great. Oh, and then, of course, I explained to her that nobody else had shared. And, uh... <laughs> oh, you're such a bully! That's terrible. <laughs> hey, it's a comedy comedy. You've know, got to keep it. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask people out there if they've got a. Um, uh, if we've got uh, any questions for for Leanne or even myself. Uh, so I'm going to go to the Q&A. Let's have a look. Uh, if you can read some as well, uh, Leanne, if you can see any. So I uh, do post your questions now. Uh, that would be great. It says, where do you stand on the page versus stage debate? Oh, what an excellent question. I think the debate is, um, if I may be so bold, absolute rubbish. <laughs> 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 I think that there... Um, those people who say that there is a difference between page and stage are um, giving a bit of a false dichotomy, I think. I think it's a spectrum. I think there are poets who work very well in performance and there are poets who work very well on page and everybody else is in um, some sort of uh, point on that line. Um, and I think that when we say to people, you're either a stage poet or a page poet, we are denying them the glory of everything that's on that spectrum. And I think that um, we really need to get over ourselves when it comes to saying that, because I think that the more that we acknowledge that every type of poetry is valuable and valid and have a place in the community of poetry i think the more um voices and um like beautiful stories that we will get to experience as poets and as poetry audiences that, that's great of course uh, shakespeare was both good on the page and on stage uh, exactly. and nobody's going to uh, put shakespeare in the corner as they say yeah that's right uh, now uh, uh, here's another one Leanne. it says you're working on a one-woman show uh, um, uh, I know you've done this in the past, so tell us a bit about that. So, um, yeah, a couple of years ago, I started working on a piece called Skip, 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 which was about my growing up as um, a teenage goth in rural Norfolk in the early 2000s. Um, so it was, uh, it was a piece that focused on sort of um, music and finding your place in the world. And uh, we're still in the process of sort of putting that together. We did um, some scratches in 2019 up at the Edinburgh Fringe, which was wonderful experience, absolutely terrifying, but really, really rewarding as well. Um, and I'm now looking to sort of... Um, broaden that out and make it bigger and make it um get some music behind it actually because it was a show about music but it didn't actually have any music in it because even though i love music and i particularly love really bad mid-2000s emo music my yes. favorite um I, uh, I i'm not i'm not a confident musician uh on any instrument so i'm i'm looking at the moment to work with a group of musicians into into putting that show to music um, and we're just looking for funding for that at the moment. So if anybody's got a spare couple of thousand pounds that they wouldn't mind just sort of popping my way, please do email me. <laughs> well, yes, uh, well, you should be uh, uh, talking to some of those musicians, uh, um, and uh, I'm sure they will. Now, so did you uh, did you dye your ear? Yeah, oh yeah, no, uh, black hair, yeah, black lipstick, black yeah. fingernails, all that, yeah, all very right. well, yeah, you, committed. You, you, you've got to post that on Twitter for us. 
Yes. Oh, yeah. I don't know if there are a huge amount of photographs. Luckily, I was a teenager just before digital cameras were a thing. So oh, right. <laughs> there well, might not uh, be any photos. If you've, if you've got one, post it up on Twitter and then we can all have a look okay. at it uh, on Twitter because I know you're very active on Twitter. You do, do a lot of stuff on Twitter. And uh, what were the Twitter angles? Is it just Leanne? It's Leanne um, Moden Poet, yeah. Leanne Moden so, Poet, yes. Yeah, so, so similar yeah. to mine. Except mine's Henry Normal poet, of course. Uh, um, to, to distinguish me from all those other Henry Normals knocking around. Uh, yeah. So uh, I love that. Now, was you a big Nick? Are you, are you still a big Nick Cave fan? Um, so Nick Cave wasn't quite my generation. It was more, and it's terrible. Like you, you won't know any of these bands, but it's yeah. stuff like Lincoln Park, oh, no, uh, Lincoln Jimmy Park. Eat World, Funeral yeah. for a Friend. Um, yeah. Fallout Boy, Panic at the Disco, all that kind of like uh, yeah, nonsense. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, you you, you underestimate, <laughs> you underestimate my gothiness. Uh, um, oh no. I used to dye my hair black, but uh, there's not too much of it to dye these days. Uh, um, but uh, no, I, I was a, a bit of a glam goth, I tend to think, oh. uh, whatever that is, weekend goth. Um, so uh, let's have a little look here. I'm looking forward to seeing that picture. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, when using form, do you ever change form from one to another? Now, that's a really interesting question. I don't tend to, no, but... Um, I have this really weird way of writing a poem in that I sort of have an idea of the kind of thing that I want to write about. And usually I sort of take a form as my first try as like a bit of a structure as we were talking about before. Yeah. And then I'll write the poem and then I'll look at the poem and I'll think, mm, I don't know if I'm quite saying what I want to say there. So I will then rewrite it in a different form form or rewrite it as a as a free verse or and I usually go through about three or four different iterations of trying different types of poem until I feel like I've said what I want to say because I feel like I can't I can't say what I need to I, I feel like a lot of the time writing for me is like getting the thought straight in my head like yeah. I'm sort of having the argument on the page with myself so it's not an efficient way to write um, but it does ensure that you get lots and lots of different versions of the poem. I agree with yeah. you. I agree with you. I think it's very much a conversation, uh, um, and uh, you don't quite know the end of it till you get to the end yeah. of the poem. Yeah, that's right. Now, um, uh, can you give us another poem? Oh, yes. Um, what shall we have now? Let's have a look. Bear with me a second. So I'm going to do for you um, this poem which is actually in the book. Let me read it to you from the book. So um, this is a poem um, that is uh, political, shall we say. Uh, it's called A Piece of the Pie. Look, everyone gets a piece of the pie, but some get more than others. It's only fair. They were here first. Or if they weren't here first, then they paid more. Or if they didn't pay more, then they certainly looked like they could afford more, which is why they got more at no extra cost. I wouldn't expect you to understand it's complicated. Some people have asked for more but didn't get it, while others could do with less but won't be persuaded to share. Some people have been coming here for years and think we owe them something. Some people can't read the menu, so those people get crumbs. Some people don't realize that some people have already eaten. Some people have already eaten but still feel the gnawing hunger. Some people haven't eaten for days. Everyone gets a piece of the pie, but some people are never satisfied. Some people have been stealing food. Someone is always stealing something. Some slices look bigger than others because some slices are bigger than others. Everyone gets a piece of the pie, except those who get nothing. And we don't mention those who get nothing in case they take a piece of our pie. Sure, some people get more pie than others, but some people have more luck than others. Some people get more pie than others, and some people get crumbs. It's a good thing it's only pie, isn't it? It's a good thing it's not our lives, isn't it? It's a good thing it's not our world, isn't it? It's a good thing it's only pie. Mm, no, 
that's great. That's that, that's a perfect poem. I I love I love um, when uh, we we use an analogy uh, and and it tells you more uh, about the situation than than if if you'd have actually said it straight on. Uh, um, and I think that's what poetry does so well. Um, yeah, yeah there, there, there's. A, I read a, a book on uh, how to write poetry uh, in my twenties, and the only line that I remember was uh, it said that you could describe a shark in terms of it being, you know, a, a fish and uh, it being maybe black and having fins uh, and be able to swim fast, and uh, it said, or you could call it a torpedo with teeth. Mm. And there's something about that greater truth of a torpedo with teeth that uh, that I love. And I think poetry does that, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. There's um, there's room to sort of, yeah, say say the universal truth, I think, by yeah. um, by putting an analogy. Really yeah, well, I, I actually call it a greater truth because it, yeah. it somehow it's somehow more than the facts. It's the feeling. And I think probably one thing that poetry does is, uh, is it communicates feeling, doesn't it? Uh, um, yeah. um, you know, uh, more than uh, you can in facts. Um, and, uh, you know, I suppose, I, I mean, there are some great speeches that you think lead towards uh, poetry. You know, uh, um, I think of Martin Luther King. Very often his speeches to me are very poetic, uh, yeah. and, you know, and, uh, and a lot of great orators. Um you know, use, uh, you know, sort of uh, rhythm and uh, uh, repetition and, uh, you know, all sorts of poetic devices, shall we say. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, uh, I've um, I've got a poem that uh, I, I put on Facebook, because uh, I do Facebook as well as uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram. Do you do Instagram? I do do Instagram, yeah. Yeah, so what's your Instagram? Uh, um... So it's um, at Leanne Emu. At Leanne Emu. I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> right, okay, put it in the chat. So, so uh, this is one I put on uh, on Facebook, and um, and uh, it was great because I put it on, and then people actually came up with better lines than mine. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to up my game here. Uh, but that's the great thing about a lot of these modern communications that you know you can communicate uh, directly with you know a, a creative person and uh, and get something back. So, so my original one was called. Um, uh, less it more it replacement uh, and uh, you know about the the idea that uh, I'm, I'm not uh, as um, uh, as rock and roll as I once was uh, and um, somebody wrote back and said uh, less Brian Ferry more Bristol cream sherry ha. <laughs> and then another one added to, after that less Brian Ferry more Britney Ferries Oh. And uh, I thought, I, I thought actually mentioning the names is a very good idea. So I, I've done a poem which mentions lots of uh, rock and roll names. Cool. Less Michael Stipe, more slippers and pipe. Less Ramones, more aching bones. Less Nirvana, more brand with Sultana. Less Linkin Park, more blinking in the dark. Less <laughs> Sex Pistols, more Ealing Crystals. Less Iggy Pop, more Lager Top. Less Jimi Hendrix, more Twin Tub Bendix. Particularly pleased with that line. Uh, less motorhead, more sourdough bread. Less white snake, more organic wheat flake. Less Axel Rose, more Waitrose. Less Pink Floyd, more easily annoyed. Less Van Halen, more sensors failing. Less Foo Fighters, more early nighters. Less Kings of Leon, more pants with we on. <laughs> less Eric Clapton, uh, more pants you've well you've had done enough of that. <laughs> Uh, so, so I posted that up, uh, Leanne, and then uh, some more came back, and uh, there were some great ones. Uh, less Metallica, more Sciatica. Uh, uh, less uh, Let's Get It On, more Ooh, My Back's Gone. Uh, <laughs> less Clint Boone, more Mills and Boone. And mm. uh, my favourite of the comments that came back was uh, less Iron Maiden, more Cream Teas Laid On. Oh, yeah. That's I like that one. It's interesting how it's like mostly food. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people like, isn't it? When you get when you get a bit older, it's oh like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I always remember, <laughs> I always remember Boy George saying he'd rather have um, uh, a cup of tea than sex. Yeah. And, and uh, now I'm at the stage where I go, oh, a cup of tea and an Eccles cake. <laughs> now you're talking. It's a bit of a yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Let's see if there's any more uh, any more questions, uh, uh, Leanne. Let's have a look on uh, Q and A, uh, and also on you can use the twat the, the the chat on the on the side of uh, of the uh, the piece. Let's have a look. Um, no, we've got those. Uh, do you prefer doing workshops or performing? Oh goodness, what a question, Dawn. Um, I like. That's such, a, that's such a good question. I like them both equally as if they were my children. <laughs> but, <laughs> and you, but you I don't like want them. to make one jealous. No, absolutely not. Well, I like them in different ways, I think. There's something really wonderful about the sort of um, adrenaline of doing a gig and performing on stage, which I really, really love. But there's something about um, making that connection um, in a workshop setting um, and getting a chance to hear back from the people that you're working with and to sort of give them a task and to have them write something beautiful as a result of something that you've said, I think is really wonderful too. So, no, I can't choose. What a, what a rubbish answer. I'm really sorry. No, that's a, that's a good answer. And do you know, do you know what? I, I can testify, um, I don't really do uh, workshops. Uh, I've done a, a few in the past. But um, I do remember workshops that I've been to in the, in the past uh, and uh, I remember the very first one was Ian McMillan, uh, and um, you know I, I, I have a, a really solid memory of uh, of that, and uh, it certainly you know uh, affected the way I uh, I think about poetry and, and I write poetry. So I can certainly testify that um, you know these things do help. Um, uh, so thank you for your your good work there, uh, Leanne, and and keep it up. Um, now I've got another question here. Um, how did you first become published as a poet uh, and have you had to overcome barriers? Oh, it's a good question. So um, I started um, sending off like individual poems to competitions and things. And actually the first time I was po published was um, a competition called the Fenland Poet Laureate. Um, mm. I was living in the Fens at the time yeah. and... Um, it was a competition to um, write a poem about the landscape and about the history of the area. So in case anybody doesn't know, the Fens is sort of that bite that's taken out with um, its sort of uh, West Norfolk, North Cambridgeshire, and then South Lincolnshire, all flat as far very, as the Very, island. very flat and a little bit yeah. uh, um, muddy at times. Yes. Yeah but beautiful in a haunting sort of uh, spooky kind of way. Um, yeah, and I, I won that competition. So that gave me like a real impetus to keep going and, and sort of saying, oh, maybe I can do this. Of course, when you are sending stuff off to competitions, I haven't won a competition since, to be yeah. fair, and that was 2013. So <laughs> um, there is an awful lot of rejection when you're sending your poems off to competitions and to be published and to go into anthologies. And um, you have to be really, really thick skinned and build up a bit of a resilience because it's oftentimes, it's not a case that your poem is bad. It's a case that perhaps your poem is about a certain theme that they don't have room for, or maybe you've written a rhyming poem and they don't want rhyming poems for whatever reason, or maybe you've um, written something that references the moon and they've already accepted a poem that references the moon. Or maybe, maybe, Leanne, they're just wrong. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe they don't wrong. like they're it and they're wrong. I, yeah. I'm looking at it. I, I've Absolutely. never actually sent anything off to a to a poetry competition and and, and never will. Uh, um, well, but I, I respect that others do. Uh, now, yeah. uh, who actually published your um, your uh, book? Uh, that's this book, this one's published by Burning Eye, uh, Burning Eye Books, which are a um, they're a publishing house based in Bristol, and they particularly publish. Um, writers who've got a bit of a performance element to them so some of their big names who they've published the people like um i think they published one of holly mcnish's early collections oh, yeah, yeah. um uh, vanessa casule who's a bristol-based poet as well um mark grift uh people like that so yeah. some really good so if somebody wants the the book uh, um can they get it online absolutely if you um if you look for liammoden.com, you can go straight there and, and buy one from me. And I've got a little box in my attic that comes out and I uh, send so you one. So you'll sign it, will you? 
I will, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, great, great. Because I know you do a newsletter, because I get your newsletter. Uh, and so oh, I know you? you're, you're very active on uh, on uh, doing stuff yourself. Now, somebody's put down the side here, uh, uh, Ju Julie uh, Anderson, uh, competitions are great fun. They are great fun. Uh, um, yeah. uh, you're, you're right. Uh, um, uh, but, um, you know, we're all entitled to... Oh, uh, I must... Our own I must just say, um, Helen Rice has put in the chat, I must just say there's an audiobook version of this as oh, well. Oh, is there? All right. So if, if you'd rather listen to the poems than read them, um, or if you have any access needs that mean that you need to have them on audio, then you can get an audio version of it. Yes, too. or so if you'd like to have the book you, and, and the audio book, yes. you can read yes, along. That, that. Would be, that would be lovely. Now, um, I think it's about time uh, we could do uh, another poem because uh, we're yeah, no, we, we, we think we're, we're all right. We're, uh, we'll we'll do another question first. Um, uh, so, has anybody else got a question? Let's have a little look. Or I'd like to have a crack at what do you think about poems being used to sell stuff like the nationwide ads? Cool, this go for that. Yeah. Such an interesting question, because I personally um, don't necessarily have a problem with poetry as a, a mode of capitalism. <laughs> I think it is... <laughs> I think it is quite lovely um, to see, particularly the nationwide ads, because everybody who appears in the nationwide ads is a real practicing performance poet. And yeah. that's very exciting to see real poets on telly. I'm less enamored with the kinds of adverts where you can tell that the poem's been written by a marketing PR person. Yeah. I was just eating a packet of Jaffa cakes yesterday, in fact, that had got a little silly little poem about how great Jaffa cakes were on the side. And I thought to myself, mm, I don't know about this. But, you know, I think that in general, I am always delighted when poetry gets a wider audience. And I think that it's, um, it's a shame to be sniffy about it. Um, if it's if it's appearing to to sell things, I don't know. I'm 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 sort of in two minds about it because it is there is something about like making sure that the art form isn't sullied by capitalism. But equally, you know, we live in a capitalist system, so we've got to work with what yeah, we've got. Yeah, I, I think I think unfortunately, if you think of all the different art forms, you think of painting, like the paintings behind me, and uh, you think of music. Uh, it's all ad um, uh, encroachment. Uh, mm. via commercialism so I don't think you're going to uh, I mean you used a very good word earlier when you were talking about a, a spectrum uh, and uh, I think uh, you know there is uh, a wide range and there's there's room for um, for poems doing all sorts of jobs I mean um, a lot of people uh, uh, sort of encounter poems at uh, funerals or weddings yeah. or uh, um, you know christenings and things like that so th they're doing a, a particular uh, job there uh, and yeah. then, uh, you know, there's lots of other um, uh, sort of ways we encounter poems and lots of other ways that we uh, we take them. I, I think if you, if you think of it in terms of um, the way we digest music, mm. um, it, it stops becoming like uh, the rules of one thing because we digest music in so many different ways. And I, I think, uh, you know, poetry can be just as... Um, diverse that's such a good way of putting it you've converted me ah, my good, good. <laughs> right I, okay i think we're ready for uh, for a poem uh, um so uh, can you give us uh, your uh, your last poem uh, um... absolutely so um this poem is uh, a type of poem called a line palindrome poem which means that you start the poem from top to bottom and it says one thing and then you reread it from bottom to top and it says something else so hopefully if i've done my job correctly that's what will happen with this poem right. um, it's called humanity this is humanity sit back and let everything fall apart it is ridiculous to assume we would want to help people we don't even know we will go out of our way to seal ourselves off from our problems. We will never think about others before ourselves. We can't contemplate the future, so we've stopped trying. We can't imagine a world 
where there is hope. There is hope. We can't imagine a world where we've stopped trying. We can't contemplate the future, so think about others before ourselves. We will never seal ourselves off from our problems. We will go out of our way to help people we don't even know. It is ridiculous to assume we would want to sit back and let everything fall apart. This is humanity. Oh, I love that. That, that must have taken a lot of work to get that uh, done. It was a bit complicated, yeah. <laughs> oh dear, yes. Uh, um, a brilliant, brilliant poem. Uh, and uh, I, I, I said at the beginning how inventive uh, you were, and I, I love that about your work. And you always surprise me. So, uh, so uh, thanks for that. And it's been uh, been brilliant uh, uh, talking to you uh, today. And uh, we could talk for another hour, but we ain't got another hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, next week, I've in fact we've only got two weeks left. So we've got next week, we've got Georgina Wilding and the week after we've got Pete Ramskill. Uh, so uh, the same uh, bat time, same bat channel, as they say. Um, so Georgina Wilding, you know Georgina, don't you? I do. Georgina is um, a friend of mine, an excellent poet, a fantastic performer and, uh, yeah, a former um, Poet Laureate of, of Nottingham as well. So you're I think in for she was the, the first one, your first um, young Poet Laureate. Yes, that's uh, right. Yeah. And uh, and of course she, uh, you know, she was a creative director of uh, the Nottingham Poetry Festival. So yeah. um, I've got a lot uh, going on there, a lot to talk about. Um, and uh, I shall be seeing you on uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, and uh, Instagram. Now I know you're on yeah. Instagram uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm following you. And thank you for the newsletters, which are great. Um, yeah, so, I didn't realise you were <laughs> you were following oh, no, me. Uh, that's yeah, yeah, very exciting. <laughs> I'll read your newsletter. Yeah. Now, if you put all the details down on the chat for other people and and uh, details of uh, uh, you know where they can get hold of uh, stuff, that that will be brilliant. Um, now we are recording these and uh, they will be up um, on the Inspire website um, in uh, in a few weeks' time, and they will be there with uh, subtitles. Uh, um, <laughs> The idea of subtitling us, Leon, seems a little bit strange, but there you go, subtitles for us. Uh, uh, um, and um, it, it makes you want to say strange things, doesn't it? So they have to subtitle them. <laughs> like tongue twisters and things like that, see if they can, <laughs> they can get them. Um, uh, so all that's happened. So I'll, well, I'd like to thank again uh, Inspire uh, and um, the Nottingham uh, Libraries and Nottingham County Council. I'd like to thank um, the Nottingham Poetry Festival and for Metronome and Confetti, NTU and the Arts Council. Um, so uh, for all making this happen, I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm going to finish with a, a poem. You've probably noticed my theme uh, this uh, this week has been um, age because I'm, I'm writing this uh, Radio 4 uh, programme. So uh, this, age, this one's uh, called FOP, F-O-P. Uh, which means a uh, flipping old person. Uh, so, uh, um, so uh, fop, but not ready to drop. So uh, thanks, Leanne, and uh, I'll see you soon. And uh, um, thank you, everybody, for, for listening and, and for watching, and uh, hope to see you soon. This is, this is fop. Today, today I'm retro. Not dead yet, though. Old school, easy to ridicule. An old codger, a coffin dodger, a walking fossil. My age, colossal, over the ill, landfill, but here still, and hard to kill. A has-been, but evergreen, retired, but not expired. Decrepit, but not ready to quit. A crone, but not quite prone. Vintage, almost out of printage. Infirm, but still going full term. Heading for the sunset, not done with the fun yet. Golden, still able to hold on. Time-tested, but not yet bested. Experience rich, not dead in a ditch. Feeling my age, not leaving the stage. On the slippery slope, but not without hope.